a seat. That's great. Uh, my name is Craig. I'm one of the pastors here, if we haven't met before. And uh, I just want to echo uh, what Aaron said at the beginning. Welcome. It's great to have you here. And especially at the 9 o'clock uh, service when we all sprang forward. And uh, so the, I, always, I always like to see who comes. These are the real Christians, the ones who love the Lord, who come at, uh, and give up an hour of sleep. Could you not tarry one hour, you know, but could you not sleep an extra hour? No, we came. So uh, it's really great, great to, uh, great to have you. Um, we are in a series that we just began on Daniel, and today the, the providence of this is great. Uh, we're going to cover Daniel 2, and I'm going to cover the whole chapter. It is, it's the longest chapter in the whole series, so we tried to pick the longest chapter for the least amount of sleep and, uh, for you. Uh, but it's a compelling story, and uh, what I want to do with this is I'm going to read it in chunks and then sort of make some comments about the story. And then at the end, I want to wrap up with what we learn from this account. Because this account, this sermon won't be so much, um, you know, three things to do. And there, there's a place for application in sermons that are three things to do. Uh, Jesus told people what to do. Paul tells people what to do. The Old Testament tells people what to do. So there's a place to say, here is what we are to do. But I think the nature of this text is, is this. This is what we are to see. What this text is going to do is provide lenses for viewing your whole life, provide lenses for viewing the world, provide lenses for us to filter how we process all of life. Um, and so that's a pretty grandiose claim, but that's what this text does. So I want to talk about how do we view life in response to what we read here. And so what we'll be walking away with is something that will help us to, uh, I trust, um, apply all of life. If you don't have a Bible, uh, if you'd grab under the seat in front of you, we're going to talk about when the dream comes true. And uh, turn to page 430. So if you don't have a Bible, normally I just kind of casually invite people. But I want to do more than casually invite. I want to like boldly, strongly invite, borderline, encourage, charge, admonish you to grab a Bible right now. Because we're going to read a lot. And it's a very good story, but it'll mean a lot more to you if you're able to read along uh, with it. So grab a Bible, turn to page 430 in the Pew Bibles there under the seat in front of you. And uh, this is Daniel 2. So I'm going to start with verses 1 through 12. This is God's word. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered to the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult <clears throat> and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Point number one, your boss is awesome. Can you imagine working for this guy? 
whoever you work for and however bad it is, point number one is you've got an awesome boss and you should show up tomorrow morning uh, with a Michael Scott World's Greatest Boss Cup <laughs> mug for your boss. It's sometimes great to, to read stories of the scripture and realize how wonderful we all really have it. Because this guy was demanding of his employees something that is impossible. So the king has dreams, and they are dreams that trouble his spirit. They are scary dreams. Why are they scary dreams? Well, because the king uh, lives in a world where it was believed that a dream, especially a bad dream, was an omen of something bad to come, or a good dream could be an omen of something good to come as well. And they believed that the gods directed them by dreams. And so a king, a pagan king like this in Babylon, would have on the payroll a number of dream interpreters, magicians, enchanters, there's various names for these individuals, uh, who would have these significant dream interpretation manuals and training in those manuals. And so when he tells them the dream, they could interpret and tell the future. They could divine the future through the dreams of the leader. Now, all of this is normal until verse 5, because in verse 5, Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, okay, I'm not going to tell you the dream. I want you to tell me the dream. And they're like, well, uh, that is impossible. They've been doing all kinds of hocus pocus, but nobody can do that. Nobody can tell him what the dream is. And he tells them, if you don't tell me what the dream is, I will tear you limb from limb and your houses will lie in ruin. Sounds like a bad day at the office for sure. But if you do tell me, wonderful things will happen. All your greatest dreams will come true. You'll be rewarded and have great honor. So the, the interpreters tell him a second time, we can't do this. And the king says, you are stalling because you can't tell me the interpretation. If you uh, tell me the dream, if you tell me the dream, I will believe your interpretation. I would say that if you could tell him the dream that he had, you know what it is, then uh, you have a lot of credibility for interpreting the dream. And so their response is so telling in verse 11, and it's one of the main points of the whole chapter. Their, their response is the thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Only the gods can do this. And so what does he do? He orders them killed in verse 12. He's angry, he's very furious, and he commands that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Last week we met Daniel who has been exported with uh, a number of leaders from Israel. In 605 BC, they have brought, been brought into exile in Babylon. And so Daniel and his three friends, these young aspiring leaders from backgrounds of nobility are now serving in Babylon and they have been trained and are among the wise men. So Daniel is about to be killed with all the other wise men because these various magicians and enchanters couldn't interpret, not only couldn't interpret, couldn't tell the king's dream. And so we start off in Daniel chapter 2 with this sense, and it's really important to pick up sort of the vibe of this text. There is a foreboding sense. Babylon is a scary place. Babylon is an uncertain place. Babylon is a place where you are vulnerable. Babylon is a place that is ominous, a scary place to live. And so if you are the king, there are scary dreams that you can't even get a good night's sleep. And if you're the magicians and the enchanters, you could die instantaneously by the king's command. It is a scary place to live in the darkness of Babylon. Verse 13 goes on. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. 
And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O king of my father, to you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Well, Daniel gets word of what's happening, and so he seeks to save himself. He seeks to save his friends. He seeks to save all the wise men because he is a blessing uh, to everyone in Babylon. He tells Arioch, the guy who's going to pull everybody together and kill them, he says, hold up, hold up. Uh, he goes in, gets an appointment with the king. I will tell him the dream. Now, he doesn't know the dream at this point. This is a bold move of faith. I will tell him the dream, gets on his calendar, and then goes home to his guys and says, guys, pray for mercy. That's what he says. Cry out for mercy because I have reported that I will be able to tell what this dream is and then give its interpretation. Well, the amazing thing happens in verse 19. The mystery is revealed to Daniel in a vision in the night. So God tells Daniel what the king's dream was in the middle of the night. And what does Daniel do? He breaks out into this sort of psalm. It's written as a mini psalm in the middle of the chapter. And it, too, is a key place for us to understand what the chapter is about. Because the chapter is about, this is what's called like a court battle, not like a, a, a judicial court, but like the court of the king. Th this plays out in what was a, a, a type, a genre of literature in the ancient Near East called the court battle, where there would be a warring in the court to see who had the most power. And here, what's being revealed is that the God of Israel, the God of Daniel and his friends, has all power over uh, the king and his God. So he breaks out because in praise because God has revealed this to him. He says in verse 20, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. There's this praise break in the middle of the narrative <clears throat> declaring that God changes times and seasons. He removes kings and set up, sets up kings. So he says, God, you are sovereign. You lift kings up. You put them down. He tells him as well, he praises the Lord and says, God knows, verse 22, what is in the darkness. He knows the deep things. He knows the hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness. Babylon is portrayed as the land of darkness. It is the kingdom of earth. It is the human kingdom. In many ways, Babylon is a type of every earthly kingdom. Any human established government uh, is ultimately a place of exile for the people of God. And so he's saying that in the middle of a dark culture, and we, we live in a dark culture, in the middle of a dark culture, you are light. And so he gives him praise that you've made known to us, he says, what we ask. You answered our prayers, so we worship you. I think this section is so key because it shows, it shows something that's really a model for us, that Daniel doesn't get the revelation and run into the king right away. Daniel gets the revelation and pauses to script this prayer, this praise, this hymn, this psalm. He stops and interacts with God. He doesn't even just run to the king and fire up a thank you, Jesus. He goes into some detail highlighting both what God has done 
and who God is. He worships God for his character. He acknowledges God. And even though our circumstances are different, each of us face the kind of urgencies on a regular basis that require us to cry out for God, to God for rescue, for help. And yet, many times we're like the nine lepers, Jesus heals ten in the New Testament, and nine of them run off to get a clean bill of health. Uh, but one of them stops and returns and thanks Jesus for healing him. This is what Daniel is modeling, that in the midst of life, in the midst of our responsibilities, it is fitting and natural to act in faith and ask for God's grace and help, as he does here. And when God does help us, there is to be a recognition of who he is and what he's done. Uh, there is this ongoing dialogue of praising God for his character. This is how we navigate life in the darkness. The way we navigate life in the darkness is by an ongoing relationship with God, listening to him, reading his word, learning of him, meditating on his scripture, practicing what he teaches, an ongoing praying without ceasing kind of verbal relationship, or at least mentally speaking to the Lord, speaking to the Lord, and then rejoicing in who he is and what he does, recognizing him, connecting the dots in our day, not just mindlessly going through our day, thinking about God a little bit in the morning and on Sundays, but thinking about God and realizing who he is and what he's done. This is, this is how we walk out a public faith because we live in a land of fear as well. We live in a land of uncertainty as well. We live in a land where people are insecure with their worries about their future as well. But we have the promises of Scripture, and we have the Spirit of God within us, and we have a relationship with the God who knows what happens in the dark, who knows the hidden and secret things, who lifts kings up and puts them down. So though we don't know everything that's happening in the future, we know the God who writes the future and rules over the future. And so there is a sense in the darkness of this great light that Daniel brings by his knowledge of God. Verse 24, therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste. And thus said to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise man, enchanter, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, uh, well, let me, yeah, let me keep going. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. So he goes into him, and there's quite a contrast here. This is a picture of Daniel serving in Babylon with humility. There's quite a contrast between Arioch and him. Arioch goes in haste, and Arioch says to the king, I have found among the exiles someone who will interpret the dream. Uh, that's not really quite how it happened. Really, Daniel went up to Arioch and said, I can interpret the dream. But when you stand before the king, you want to be the one, you want a finder's fee. You know, I found this guy. Maybe I can get in on the reward. Contrast that with Daniel. Arioch, I have found. Contrast that with Daniel's attitude. No wise men, no enchanters, no magicians or astrologers can show the king what he has asked. No one can do this, but there is a God in heaven. Do you see the contrast between self-motivation, self-promotion, that's life in Babylon, that's life in America, versus the humble approach 
which says, I am not able, but God is able. I do not know, but my God knows. Daniel functions in Babylon with humility. He honors his source. He credits God. He, he realizes that his calling is to make God known. He's in exile to make God known, and this is an opportunity. And were he to take credit for it, it would, it would, uh, it would cover, it would squander the opportunity. It would hide the work of God rather than reveal it. Verse 31, here's the dream. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you look, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was the dream. He sees this massive metallic figure, and, and it's, it's a frightening image. The head is of gold, the chest is of silver, the middle and the thighs are of bronze, the lower legs of iron, and the feet are an iron and sort of clay mixture. And you can see why the omen is scary to Nebuchadnezzar, because there is this large figure uh, that is ultimately assaulted and destroyed. There is a rock that is not cut out by any human hand. So there is this, the implication is, this divine rock, this divine stone that comes hurling at the feet of this beast, hurls at the feet of it, and the feet disintegrate, the whole thing falls down, and it's like the chaff of wheat when a wind comes and blows it all away. So you can see why that's scary. It means something, but he's got to be thinking, what does it mean? Am I the statue? Am I the rock? Uh, what, what is going on here? Uh, the, and, and who is this stone that becomes a mountain and remains forever? So you can see if, if he's thinking the gods are speaking to me, this doesn't look good. This is a dream that is characterized by destruction, violence, and a utter sweeping away of one thing to bring in something else. Well, Daniel then interprets the dream in verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all things. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it. And just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix one another in marriage. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. 
just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this dream. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to the hinglet and commanded that an offering and incense be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal the mystery. Well, Nebuchadnezzar falls at the feet of Daniel and inappropriately uh, worships Daniel because of the dream that Daniel has revealed to him. Turns out it's good news, Nebuchadnezzar. You're the head of gold. And he uses really unusual language here to describe it. You're the king of kings. Now, that doesn't mean he's the divine king. Jesus is the king of kings. But earthly, from an earthly level, your kingdom in Babylon is great. And he, he tells him that you rule over all people. You rule over the animals. God has entrusted to you a great kingdom. And the kingdoms that will arise after you are all inferior. So you see it goes from gold to silver, from silver to bronze, from bronze to iron, and then a mix of iron and clay. But in the middle of all this, there is some news that is perhaps not so great. It's easy to read over if you're Nebuchadnezzar. It's great to hear you won the gold. You are the gold. But in there as well is this word in uh, verse 39 where he tells him, another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And then a third kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, your reign, your day is momentary. It is temporary. You are lifted up for a short time, but there's coming someone after you, and there's coming a kingdom after that, and there's coming a kingdom after that, uh, and then there will be one that will be unlike any other kingdom, and what it's going to be is it's just going to start out as a rock. It's not, does it doesn't look like gold. It doesn't look like silver. It doesn't look like bronze. It doesn't even look like iron. It's just a little rock. But what this rock, which is cut by no human hand, will do is this little rock will end up being greater than all other rocks. It will come in and take over the other kingdoms. And from this little rock, it will become a mountain. And from a mountain, it will spread into a mountain range that will cover the entire world. This kingdom will dominate. Look at verse 44 again. In these days, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break into pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. The great God has made known that he is from a small rock going to build a kingdom that will be distinguished by taking over all kingdoms and will be distinguished by lasting forever. The little rock is a king and a kingdom greater than all others because it is an eternal kingdom. This kingdom will dominate, he says. And then in verses 48 and 49, we finish the chapter. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So after this amazing revelation, he and his friends take posts of leadership and oversight in Babylon. So how do we apply something like that in our life today? Well, I think what's going on here, and especially with the psalm that's in the middle of it, I think what's going on here is God is teaching us something through a narrative story, through a vision. He's teaching us something about how life works. He's teaching us something about who rules and who reigns. And he's giving us a picture of how we are to filter all of life. And I think the first point that's so clear in this passage is the limitations of human wisdom. 
This is a chapter about the limitations of human wisdom. A key takeaway from the chapter is that for all its grandeur and all its glory, Nebuchadnezzar is the head. He is the gold. His kingdom is the gold kingdom that rules over all the other kingdoms and the successive kingdoms following him will be lesser kingdoms. He is as good as it gets in the world and yet Babylon is ignorant. The limitations of their wisdom. That they Look at verse 10. This stood out when we read it. The Chaldeans answered the king, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. No great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing. Verse 11, the, king, the thing that the king asked is difficult and no one can show it. We don't know what your dream was. No one can know what your dream was. We live in darkness. So there's a, the ignorance of Babylon is on display. The limitations of human knowledge. Um, Dale Ralph Davis, in his commentary uh, on this, writes, Life is a dead-end street without a God who discloses what the future holds. He's telling exiled, exiled Israel that there's no need to be awed by paganism, despite its trappings and splendor, for it is nothing but empty and dark. The world's wisdom is empty and dark. Babylon is a scary, uncertain place. We see this when the most powerful man on the planet can't even get a good night's sleep with all the security and all the power and seemingly his future bright in front of him, yet he is tormented with a fear of what is coming. He has a dream that he knows is predictive, but he does not know what it predicts. It's a frightening dream. Of, of destruction where there is this golden head, but the golden head is supported by feet of clay, which could never hold it up. The king lives in a scary world. Those who work for him have a terrifying vulnerability. All the missions, all the magicians and all the enchanters, they are executed. Life in Babylon and in every earthly kingdom is uncertain and can offer us no certainty about what will happen in the future or if there's even any meaning to the future. Babylon can't define the future and Babylon can't give true meaning to the future either. You feel this right now. If you scroll through your news feed, you feel just the panic of uncertainty. Caleb prayed about it at the pastoral prayer. We live in a world where there, when uncertainty comes, there is a panic, an absolute panic, which the only thing we know to do is people are getting sick, so go to Costco and buy 150 water bottles or something because we don't know what to do. There's, no one knows what to do in the darkness. No one knows what to do. Only one knows what is in the darkness, and only one is governing and directing and guiding our lives and our history in the darkness. The one who gives wisdom to the wise and direction to his people through his word, the scripture, assures us that he is good and that he is with us and that he will direct us. And when the first readers of this book, those who are in exile in Babylon, read this, they read this story that, yes, Babylon looks mighty and powerful and all-knowing, but Babylon is ignorant. The God of Israel is the God of wisdom. Take courage and be strong is the message to them. By showing the contrast of the king and his wise men and Daniel and his God, the text shows that Babylon is bankrupt. So don't put your ultimate trust in Babylon. Put your ultimate trust in the God of the whole world. That's the message of the chapter. In her commentary on Daniel, uh, Wendy Witter writes the following. She says, there is a world of knowledge and wisdom that apart from God's revelation is inaccessible to people. No amount of corporate expertise, self-help psychobabble, or even scientific research can reveal these truths. For Daniel, this knowledge was encoded into a revelatory dream about the future. For us, it is encoded in the knowledge of God written in the scripture. Christians have long recognized that God has revealed himself generally through creation truth that is accessible to all. 
and he has revealed himself specially through the Bible and through Jesus. This revelation is only accessible to us through the testimony of the Spirit who convicts us of its truth and then helps us to understand and live its counterintuitive, countercultural message. It says things like, we must die to live. We must lose to gain. We should rejoice in suffering and pray for those who persecute us. In the words of the 5th century bishop, Theodoret of Cyrus, such divine mysteries lie beyond the capacity of human wisdom without assistance from above. You never know how to live in Babylon ultimately for the glory of God in a secure future without the scripture because the general revelation of creation will never tell you you must die to live, you must lose to gain, you must pray for those who persecute you, you must live humbly. That's the words of Jesus who tells us how to live. The limits of limitations of human wisdom. Secondly, there is the limitations of human power. So Nebuchadnezzar gets the diagnosis. You are the gold head in the story. But verse 37 says, you king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, you only rule because God allows you to rule. You only rule because he has placed you there. Daniel praises God in the psalm in verse 21. He says he changes times and season. He removes kings. He sets up his kings and tears down kings. He's a little rock that will come and knock down all the kingdoms and rule and reign on his own. There are limitations to human power. Therefore, Israel in exile, fear not. God is in control. God is in control. There's debate over Uh, There's no debate over who the gold is. The gold is Nebuchadnezzar. There's debate over who is silver, who won silver, bronze, and iron. Uh, Probably the most common view among evangelicals who believe that God uh, allows Daniel to prophesy the future. Some don't believe that, but uh, assuming that God, uh, Daniel prophesies the future, which I clearly believe, uh, most people think that it is the gold is Nebuchadnezzar, the silver is the Medo-Persians, The bronze is Greece, and the iron is Rome. And it is into Rome that the kingdom of God comes and ultimately spreads to the whole earth. But regardless of how someone interprets what each uh, nation represents, what each image represents, it's better to read this as a theology of history rather than a timetable of history. The goal is to see how God works overall. Rather than spend all of our time placing bets on who's silver and who's bronze, what is abundantly clear is who is the rock? Who is the little rock? Jesus is the stone, the rock. He's the one who comes and is presented in the New Testament as the rock, the stone which the builders rejected. And upon him is built the whole house of God. The whole people of God are built on him, the temple. The whole people of God are built on Jesus. The stone rejected becomes the cornerstone of all that God is building. This is the Lord Jesus. He is the little rock. He he uses this language of the kingdom. His kingdom is not like Nebuchadnezzar, bold in all of its, uh, you know, sort of vain proclaimings. He is one. His kingdom comes small. He says this, my kingdom's like the smallest seed. It's like a little mustard seed, very unimpressive, very small, easy to miss. But you plant that and it becomes a great tree. He says, my kingdom's like a little bit of yeast. You just hardly even notice it, but you put it in the bread and the whole thing grows. That's the kingdom of Jesus. He comes. He's rejected by his own people, the people of God. He's rejected by people who don't see him for what he is. He he dies. On all external appearances, it looks like he fails. He's no king. He's one who dies and is crucified by Rome. And yet he's raised from the dead to defeat the power of Rome and the power of all those who would reject him. And, and what happens is his kingdom grows as one person tells another, tells another, tells another. And, and the kingdom is spreading till one day the knowledge and the glory of God will cover the entire world as the waters cover the earth. He is the rock that is building a mountain and will one day be a mountain range when he returns to rule over his kingdom. So from Nebuchadnezzar's vantage point, this is all future. Everything's happening in the future. How about for us? 
Is this future or is it past? I'm talking like it's past, but it's both. It's future and it's past. The kingdom is here and the kingdom is yet to come. The kingdom is already present by the spirit through the word and the people of God because Christ is resurrected. And the kingdom is yet to come when Jesus comes in person and rules his kingdom. We live under his rule and reign at the same time we live under an earthly kingdom. And that was the message to those in exile. You live in, ba- the, you live in the kingdom of Babylon, but your ultimate address is the kingdom of God, which for them is to come and which for us has already come in, in the presence of Jesus. We are two kingdom people. We live according to two stories. Uh, we're not single story people. We're two story people. We live in the kingdom of this world. So there's a story that is going on that we play a part in and act to bring good news to others, to serve others, act for the common good of those around us. But we are animated and motivated and empowered by another story, the kingdom that is present in Jesus and the kingdom that will come in fullness at his return. The last point, I think, is for us to be gripped by the glory of God's kingdom. That really, the whole story is about the little rock that grows and covers the whole earth. That is the glory of the story, the glory of God's kingdom. So it tells us the limitations of human wisdom. We can't figure it out. It tells us the limitations of human power. God raises up one king and brings another, and he will ultimately bring his own kingdom in fullness. But it lastly tells us the glory of God's kingdom. God is doing something on earth. History is moving purposefully to reach his end. He is accomplishing his will. He is Lord of history, and it matters. It matters for your family. It matters for your health. It matters for your future. See, if you're in exile in Babylon, you're kind of thinking, what happened? Did we just blow it? Has God left us forever? And these accounts, these stories report no. God is with you. God is working. God has placed people in the highest realm of authority, and he's steering this whole thing. That's what they come to see. God is sovereign. His kingdom is above all. There is a meaningful movement to history, and it is the invisible hand of God accomplishing his purposes, even when we can't see it, who will one day return restore and build his kingdom forever in a new heavens and new earth so this is going somewhere wonderful and that vision is to motivate us at Yale there is a library called the Beinecke library it's a rare book library and out in front of it there is a sunken garden and in the sunken garden it is uh, three pieces of art that are meant to simulate the universe it's a pretty lofty goal to simulate the whole universe. So there is a, a marble pyramid in one corner that represents time. And there is kind of a donut looking figure that is stood up on its side that represents energy. And then the third point in the garden is a die, the, the singular of dice, like you roll, roll a die. There's a die that is up on its point showing that when it comes down, it could come down any direction, and it represents chance. And so the picture of the universe in that artistic uh, display in the garden is that the universe is run by time, by energy, and by chance. And Daniel 2 says that nothing could be farther from the truth. The universe is run by the God who spoke it into existence, And his son who has come is building a kingdom that will take over all the other kingdoms and it will endure forever and ever and ever and ever. And so as Daniel is placed in Babylon to bring light to those around him, so are we. We don't spout off an arrogance that we know God. Daniel's not arrogant. He said, this is the Lord. It's not me. We, We live humbly. We live winsomely. We live compassionately but we have something to offer a world that is dominated like Babylon by fear and uncertainty. We have the God of the universe. We have the Savior, Jesus Christ, who is bringing all things to a purposeful, glorious end, and we're part of that story. Dale Ralph Davis, again, he's my favorite commentator who sounds like a NASCAR driver, Dale Ralph Davis. Uh, he, uh, his name does. Uh, he, he said this, We who hold this kingdom view can easily forget 
how unbearably sad Joe and Jane Pagan might be, for they go out of their front door in the morning and have no idea where history is heading or if it is heading. No idea where it's heading or if it's even heading anywhere. Maybe it's all too cerebral, but I can only say that if I didn't believe Daniel 2.44, I couldn't find energy to place one foot in front of another. Daniel 2.44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. He says, if I didn't believe that, I don't know how it would go on. And we're surrounded by people that are longing, we may be one of them, that are longing for an answer, a direction, a purpose. And it's found in the eternal work of Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who rose from the grave, who ascended to the right hand of the Father and now is ruling and reigning over all and will one day restore all things. So what do we do while we wait for his kingdom? I think that's in the story too. Notice what Daniel did and his friends. It just says he got them appointed Uh, He governs all of Babylon and all the wise men. So he comes in just a few years ago getting trained. Now he's their boss because God's promoted him and he's been faithful. And all his friends, well, what are they doing? They're running the affairs of Babylon. It's an amazing picture. On the weekend, Daniel is giving a vision of the entire future of the universe and Nebuchadnezzar's brief brief but glorious role in the midst of it and Nebuchadnezzar is on his face worshiping Daniel on the weekend and on Monday they're all at their desk doing their job it's really amazing isn't it that they don't say oh it's the rock we got the story now we know how it ends we got the rock so let's go to the mountains and hide out until the rock comes and knocks down all that we don't know how long the gold silver bronze we don't know how long that's going to take so let's just hide out no they get busy they get to work They invest their lives building Babylon without ever compromising. We never see Daniel compromise. He is in Babylon, but Babylon is not in him. What does he do? He says, the rock is coming, the eternal kingdom, so I'm going to work my tail off building Babylon. I'm going to give my life for the common good of others. And do you know, this is exactly what God tells them in exile. He brings them in exile, and God tells them, listen, I have a purpose for you in exile, and this is a word to all of us. It's Jeremiah, the prophet, communicates this. Jeremiah 29 says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, okay, they're the ones in the Daniel story, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Daniel walks this out in a model way. He gives the revelation of God. He points forward to Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And then he sits down at his desk and does his work running Babylon. This is a vision for us because Christ has come and been faithful in what he has done. Even when we're faithless, he is faithful. So in our own faithlessness, we run to Christ for forgiveness and empowering to be restored to the faithful life that he has called each of us. And then we pray, Lord, how can I act for the welfare of where you've placed me, the city I'm in, the neighborhood I'm in, the family I'm in, uh, the workplace, my, my job, my hobbies. How can I live for the welfare of the city? I pray that I live in exile, but I pray that I be faithful to bring good to others. And the ultimate good I bring to others is exactly what we see here. It's an announcement of the good news of the kingdom that is here and is yet to come in Jesus Christ. That's what we share. One writer I read said this, there are opportunities in a dark world for believers who know God. That's what this chapter is about. There are opportunities in a dark world 
We don't panic in the dark. We don't freak out in the dark. We don't run and huddle up with a little flashlight in the mountains, avoiding the dark. We cry out to God to give us eyes to see in the dark. For he is in the dark and sees all things. And then we seek to be faithful where he's placed us. And we seek to announce the news of what is happening in Jesus Christ and what is yet to come. And so all that we do plays into that. For the welfare of the city, for the good of others, for the faithfulness of God. Christopher Wright says everything in his commentary on Daniel, everything we do matters. He says every act of obedience, every word of witness, and every courageous stand for the truth is worthwhile and vindicated in the light of our future. It's by looking forward that we have courage to act today, to be faithful today, to give witness today, to, to live with a public faith. That's what this whole sermon's been about, to live with a public faith in a private faith world because we know the God who began it all. We know the God who is rescuing people in the midst of the darkness and giving light. And we know the God who will return when the glory of the Lord covers the earth and the new heavens and the new earth. When the rock that appeared small to us at first is the mountain and the range of mountains that cover the entire world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us and how an experience of people 2,600 years ago matters to us today. For you are a God who is doing an eternal work. Lord, you spoke to people in exile in Daniel's day, and you speak to us as well. And we pray that you would guard our fears, and we have them. We have plenty of them. You would guard our limitations, help us in our limitations of wisdom and limitations of power, for we have none apart from you. And we pray that you would grant us grace and strength to be faithful, for to be faithful where you've placed us. Help us, O oh God, that we may pray and serve and act for the welfare of the city, for the welfare of those around us, for in there we find our welfare. For in there we find you at work. We praise you, O oh God. Let's stand together.